Well, good morning to everybody and welcome to the service here at Westgate Chapel. Um, Gareth, our pastor, is away for the week. Um, he did say he might pop in, but I haven't seen him, so I'm assuming he's not actually going to be here. So I'm stepping into a space. Most of you know me. Uh, for those of you who don't, my name is Rob. I'm one of the members here at Westgate. Okay. So let's, uh, I've got a couple of notices. In fact, I've got one notice because I'm not sure of any others, so shout out if there are. My only notice was really just to remind people about the prayer meeting on Wednesday evening at 8 o'clock. Uh, being held via Zoom still at the moment, but you are welcome to join us. The link will come out on the church email uh, normally on Wednesday morning or maybe possibly even Tuesday. And no other notices? You're not aware of any notices, Duncan? No. No? And I'll be taking the prayer meeting. So it's either a good thing or a bad thing. Okay, so Duncan will be taking the prayer meeting. That's advance notice. <laughs> Okay, it's good to come into God's house, isn't it? Let's come to God in prayer, remembering where it is that we've come to. So let's just pause and pray. Heavenly Father, we do recognise that we are coming into a sacred place. Father, we recognise that we're coming into the gathering of the saints and we come because you call us to come. So Father, help us now to set aside the things of the day, to focus our minds on you, and Lord, as we come into your very presence, we ask that you will accept us because of Jesus. Clothe us in his righteousness. Do not look upon our sin, but instead accept us through your mercy. And Father, we pray that everything we offer up to you today will be acceptable in your sight. And that as we look into your blessed word, we will hear you speaking into our very souls. Mm. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, the psalmist calls us to worship uh, with these words from Psalm 95. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are, his, we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Do not harden your heart. We're going to sing our opening song. It's a great hymn, one of my favourites. Uh, a great classic hymn, Tell Out My Soul.
And it's so frustrating, is it, not to be able to actually sing? <laughs> so, we, uh, we had the pleasure a few weeks back of going out to uh, Mickfield Evangelical Church. And for those of you who know it, it's got a lot of land all the way around it. So right the way through the pandemic, they've been able to meet outside in a big marquee and they've been able to sing. So we were there Easter Sunday and it was great just to be able to actually sing at the top of your lungs. Okay, Ed is going to give... Where is, where is Ed? Oh, there he is, hiding away there, Ed. Ed is going to give our talk for the children. So listen in to Ed. Okay, boys and girls, it's good to see you this morning, those of you that are here. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll have uh, some pictures and bits and pieces come up on the screen. I've forgotten my notes, so I'm going to be turning around all the time or trying to remember off the top of my head. You need to try and remember your uh, catechism that we are doing uh, each week. And if you can remember the question and the answer, there are prizes for the children and for the adults in the congregation. Uh, so don't forget, we need to still be working through our catechism. And today, we are on question number four. So, I've got a question up here um, to make you think. And it says this. In Bible times, how did the king show his people that he ruled the land? Now, obviously, you guys, being intelligent, will know so perhaps come up with some good ideas on how a king would say, I'm in charge, I'm the most important, and I rule this country. What sort of thing do you think they did? Did they put up castles? No, that was William the Conqueror. He put up great big castles to say, look at me, I'm in charge, we're here to stay, we're not going anywhere. What do you think a king could do to show that they're the most important ruler in the land? That's a really tough question. What could they do? Deathly silence. Go on, shout it out. I think this is a bit philosophical. It's a philosophical <laughs> answer going on there, which is a bit detailed. I think probably you've got the right idea. Go on, please. They charge taxes. Ooh. They tax people. Okay, they could do, yeah. They could catch people. Well, I'm going to tell you what they did, because it's quite tricky. They would put up great big statues all over the place of either themselves or the god that they worshipped. So you would be a poor peasant living in Bury St Edmunds or whatever country you are, not in Bible times, living uh, down in the, uh, the Far East and you'd be sat there and you'd wake up in the morning and you'd open your eyes and you'd blink and you'd open your curtains and there, outside the window, is a massive, great statue of the king in charge of you, or the, uh, the gods that they worshipped. And there's some pictures there on the screen of some of the gods that were worshipped in Bible times. And they were put up to remind you of who's in charge. Okay, and it was an image of the god or the king, and I think there's another one there. I know Isis is definitely ancient Egyptian, okay? My, my Near East God knowledge is, is somewhat lacking, but there we go. But definitely Isis is ancient Egypt. So you would have these statues all over the place. All over the place. Now, a little quick link here, it's not on the screen, but uh, I think every single question, I've had a Star Wars link. I'm pretty sure Emperor Palpatine also put up statues of himself uh, when he was in charge. But anyway, uh, we'll move on. So what's that got to do with our question and our catechism today? Well, Genesis chapter 1 tells us about creation. And in uh, Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, we're told that God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. So what did God do to show that he was kind of in charge of this earth? Well, he didn't put up images of himself. He didn't put up statues of himself. But he made us humans as images of him. That we represent God. That we kind of echo a little bit what God is like. Okay, that makes us very, very different to all the other animals and bits and pieces that God made that we'll look at next week, that God made us 
in his own image. And uh, in today's Sunday School, we're going to go through uh, and we're going to have a look at the type of how God um, is represented by us, how we mirror what God's like. And like I said, we're more than statues, we're so much more than statues. We are, in other bits of the Bible, we're told we're the pinnacle, the highest point, the best bit of God's creation. So we're going to be looking at the creation story, particularly looking at uh, when God created Adam and Eve, and that's what we're going to be studying in Sunday school today. So we need to read the question, and we need to read the answer together. Okay, so uh, after three, uh, one, two, three. How and why did God create us? God created us, male and female, in his own image to glorify him. That was the worst mumbling ever, but I'm going to let you off because you've all got masks on. So I'm going I'm to let you off. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. How and why did God create us? God created us, male and female, in his own image to glorify him. And uh, the children's song, shall I say up here, Rob? Yes. Is that what's next? Excellent, good. The children's song from Awesome Cutlery is one I've not heard before, uh, but Gareth picked it because it talks about being made in God's image. Something beautiful Placed by you with care among them all Every piece unique and different Your love shining through You're the artist, we're the image Made to be like you I want to know who I am, so I'll listen to you You are God and you tell me what's true I want to see who I'll be when you're working in me You made us to show your glory Who I am, so I'll listen to you. 
I want to know who I am, so I'll listen to you. You are God, and you tell me what's true. I want to see who I'll be when you're working in me. You made us to show your glory. Probably notice I've got my grandchildren with me all week, and uh, we'll be playing that CD in our car all week. I can tell you. So, uh, normally get it all the way from Southampton back up to here. So, okay, children, time for you to go out with Ed through to the side. So, in my my free going out. Yep. Have a great time. Glad Gareth picked that song actually. He, he, he did know what my text is. Uh, but I'm actually going to be talking later on about the glory of God and how we see the glory of God. So I think he's picked up quite well that part of the way we see the glory of God through us. Okay? And that's an awesome responsibility, isn't it? I think that people are looking for the glory of God in us. Scary thoughts. Let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer because you are a prayer answering God. Lord, you, although almighty, although all powerful and sovereign, you are interested in us. So, Father, we lift up to you our concerns and our worries. We pray for those, Lord, amongst our congregation who are unwell at this time. We think particularly of Dee. But there are others, Lord, who are struggling with various health issues at the moment, and therefore we, we lift them to you, and we pray, Lord, that you will work even through these difficult situations to be glorified. Father, we pray for this church here at Westgate Chapel. We pray that you will help us as we go, or as we come out of this period of lockdown, uh, guide um, Gareth and the leaders to, to know how best to ease us back into normal church again. We pray, Lord, that it will not be so long before we can start to meet again in house groups, before we can start to sing to you, before we can start, Lord, to meet maybe midweek to pray together. But in the meantime, Lord, we do thank you for the, the wonders of technology. And we ask, Lord, that you will help us to use these to maximum uh, effectiveness so that your word continues to go out, so that the gospel is heard, and so that we can gather as a, a fellowship of believers, albeit remotely, to worship you together. Father, we do pray at this difficult time for our government, as they try to lead our country. Lord, so many decisions to make, so many difficult decisions, literally life-changing decisions. And therefore, Lord, we pray that you will rise up in, amongst Parliament, those who are Christian, those whose first priority in their life is you and honouring you, and that their voice will be heard, that it will not be squashed, that it will not be silenced and ignored. Father, we do pray for ourselves as we as individuals try to come to terms with having been out of direct fellowship with people for so long, I'm thinking, Lord, particularly those who are listening online this morning. Help us, Lord, to um, have that eagerness again to meet together, to share true fellowship with each other. And, Lord, if we can't do that face-to-face, -face, then, Lord, we, may we use the wonders of the internet, may we use the telephone, may we, Lord, just come alongside each other and encourage each other and just 
just to let, let each other know that we are caring uh, and we are still praying and we are still loving each other. Father, we do ask that in this town your word will go forth today. We pray, Lord, for all those Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches in this area and beyond. And we pray, Lord, that you will indeed, through your spirit, ensure that your word goes out clearly and boldly. And Lord, finally we think about ourselves today in the next half hour or so as we look into your word. Our prayer, Lord, is that you will be our teacher, that you will open our eyes, that you will give us understanding. But more importantly, Lord, that you will help us to take these things to our hearts, that they may change us and make us more like Jesus. And we ask that in his name. Amen. 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 We're going to sing again. Uh, it's Behold Our God. I've never sung I haven't sung for a long time, actually. So we're going to sing Behold Our God.
turn to God's Word. Uh, we're going to read from Exodus chapter 33. I think it's going to come up on the screen. Uh, reading from verse 12 through to the end of the chapter. And it's the account of Moses before he goes up onto the mountain for the second time to receive the Ten Commandments. So Exodus uh, 33, reading from verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know who you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favour with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so that I may know you and continue to find favour with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very things you have asked, because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Let's just pray as we come to open God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We know it is your divinely inspired word. We know it is your way of speaking to us. And Father, we pray that you will speak today, and you will indeed show us your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when I come to prepare sermons, I, I love preaching, as you know. I love preparing sermons. Um, but there are certain times when I'm sitting down to prepare a sermon, and I just know this is a big sermon. Not big because of me. Um, thankfully, not big because it's going to be long. <laughs> it might be. <laughs> but big because it covers a big subject. And this is a big subject, the glory of God. I would say you could barely get a bigger subject. So this is a big sermon, and I pray that God will use it to inspire us to see him for who he truly is. It was a great 20th century preacher, A.W. Tozer, one of my favourite authors, apart from anything else, um, who once wrote, God is looking for men in whose hands his glory is safe. By that, Tozer meant that God is seeking, seeking people for whom his glory is the primary focus of everything they do. You know, if we don't make living for the glory of God the primary focus of our lives, then we will walk a half-hearted Christian walk. And we will always live disappointed lives. Because we'll always think that we could have done better for God. That we could have somehow been a better Christian. We need to make God's glory that priority. And when we do, when we devote ourselves to bringing glory to God in everything we do, then our relationship with him will bring us so much joy, so much excitement, that we will wonder why we ever settled for anything less. Now Moses was a man who lived to glorify God. Moses was a man in whose hands God's glory was set. He'd been called by God to lead the Israelites out of, the, out of Egypt into the promised land. But they were an unfaithful people. And they were constantly rebelling against God. Moses had been on Mount Sinai once before. And if you remember, while he was away, the people built a golden image to worship instead of God. This was a rebellious people. And that was probably just a foretaste of what Moses was going to be in for for the next 40 years as he led them through the wilderness. If he was ever to succeed then he needed to know, he needed to be constantly reminded who God was. Back in verse 12, he prayed, 
Teach me your ways so that I may know you. And now in verse 18 he cries out, Show me your glory. Show me your glory. So what is this glory that Moses longed to see? Well, theologians would call it the intrinsic glory of God. Intrinsic simply means the characters, uh, the, the characteristics that make a person who they are. So the glory of God is, we sometimes call it God's attributes. It, what, it's what makes God who he is. So things like his holiness, his power, his mercy, his absolute sovereignty, his love. All the things that come together to make God who he is. Moses says, that's what I want to be reminded of. I want to be reminded who you are. Moses' life was going to be lived utterly dependent on God. And therefore he needed to know who God was. Now can I just say, if Moses needed to pray that, then how much more do we? After all, this was Moses. He'd already heard God speak out of a burning bush. He'd already witnessed the plagues and the Passover back in Egypt. He'd seen God with his own eyes part the Red Sea. He had seen God bring water out of a rock. And yet he still prays, Lord, show me your glory. You know, no matter where we are in our spiritual life, whether we're right at the beginning or we've been a Christian for many years, whether our heart is on fire for God, or whether we're feeling maybe a bit lukewarm, maybe we're feeling encouraged or maybe we're feeling a bit despondent, we need to pray, Lord, show me your glory. Every time we open our Bible, Every time we sit down to pray, every time we enter the doors of this church, we need to pray, Lord, show me your glory. In fact, every time you listen to a preacher, including me, you need to pray that he shows you God's glory. You know, if the preacher is just interested in showing you how clever he is, if he's just interested in sharing his thoughts on life, if he just wants to make you feel better, to soothe your conscience, to stroke your egos, then pack up your Bibles and leave. Because he's not doing his job. His job is to show you God's glory. It was the great preacher James Montgomery Boyce who observed that in preaching we must be lifting up the greatness of God. Because when we do, Boyce said, it lowers man and puts him in his proper place. Whereas he says, when we magnify man, we diminish God. You know, preaching needs to be God-centered before it will ever be man-changing. Therefore, every Sunday, before the preacher even opens his mouth, I urge you to pray, Lord, show us your glory. Show us your glory. Now, do you notice in verse 19 how God responded to Moses? He said, And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom, on whom I have compassion. Now, just to explain this, in the Bible, a person's name represented more than their title. It represented who they were. So for God to proclaim his name means that he is going to reveal to Moses something about what he's like. He will show Moses something of his glory. You know, if it were not for the fact that God had chosen to reveal himself to mankind, we would have no way of knowing what he's like. He is beyond us. We'd have no way of knowing just how glorious he is. And what's more, the only things we can know for sure about God are what he's revealed to us. In Hebrews 1, verse 1 to 2, we read this. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. You see, God revealed certain things about himself on two main occasions. 
in the past, long ago, through the prophets, and more recently through his son, through Jesus Christ. And everything he revealed has been recorded for us in scripture. That is what we know. And that is all that we know. That is all that we are permitted to know. In Revelation 22, we are warned that we must never add to what God has told us about his glory. We must never add to it our own imagination of what God is like. Or maybe our own idea of what we would like God to be like. And we're also warned in that same chapter we must never take away from it. We must never ignore parts of God's character that we don't like. So many Christians are uncomfortable with the fact that God is a wrathful God. God is a just God. But these all put together are what makes God who he is. And that is what he's revealed to us. And that is what we must stick to. The very next verse in Hebrews tells us that the sun is the radiance of God's glory. And the exact representation of his being. You see, when God spoke to us through his son, one of the key things he showed us was his glory. The sun is the radiance of his glory. Jesus, more than anybody else, shows us just how glorious God is. That's why the Apostle Paul declared in 1 Corinthians 1, 22 to 23, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ. Because Christ shows us God's glory. <laughs> Later on in 2 Corinthians, he said this, for what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ. For God made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Jesus Christ. Let me stick that back on here, it won't work. This was Gareth's high tech, he uses blue tech to stick this to the mic, to the... Uh, Lectern. If that falls off again, I'll put it on top. Hopefully I haven't broken it. Paul preached Christ. And the reason he preached Christ is because he realised the truth that John opened his gospel by saying in John 1.14. He said, the word became flesh and he dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. The glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Brothers and sisters, there is no better way to see the glory of God than to look into the face of Christ. Although God agrees that he's going to reveal himself to Moses, he puts limits on it. He's only prepared to do it in a very restricted way. In verse 21 to 23, he responds... But you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. There is a place near me where you will stand on a rock. And when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft in the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. And then, only then, will I remove my hand and you will see my back. But my face must not be seen. Do you realise that if God had fully answered Moses' prayer, it would have killed him? If God had fully revealed his glory to Moses, it would have been more than any mortal human could stand. Therefore, in his mercy, he limits what he will allow Moses to see in order to protect him. And God limits what we see of his glory. But what we see is enough. He places Moses in the cleft in a rock and he covers him with his hand so that he may not come face to face with the full glory of God. It would, all, it would be more than he could stand. All he could see was a glimpse. It's described as seeing a glimpse of the back of God as he passes by. And that was enough. That was enough. And just in case you're sitting there wondering what good look God looks like, don't bother. Because nobody knows. Not even Moses. And Moses came that close to him. God is simply too glorious for our finite minds to comprehend. 
And therefore what he reveals to us is limited. And so in Exodus 34, we read that the very next day, Moses ascends up onto Mount Sinai for a second time to present himself before God and receive the commandments from God. But God warns him again to come alone. In Exodus 34, verse 3, he says, No one is to come with you or to be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and the herds may graze in front of the mountain. This experience was to be for Moses and Moses alone. You know, when I read these verses, I, I just, I laugh at some of the people who said they've been to heaven, they've seen God, they've come back and they've written a book about it. Mm. It's total nonsense, friends, it's total nonsense. Mm. Chapter 34 continues, it says, Then the Lord came down in the cloud, and he stood there with him, and he proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children to this, for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation. I haven't got time to go into that, but ask me later if you're confused by that passage. <laughs> Moses had prayed, show me your glory. And God answers his prayer. First he appears shrouded by a cloud. Again, in, in his mercy, he's protecting Moses. He'd done this, as you know, on several occasions before, such as in Exodus 16, verse 10, where we read, there was the glory of the Lord appearing in a cloud. He was protecting Moses from the effects of seeing his full glory. He appears shrouded in a cloud. Then he proclaims his name, the Lord. And then he says it twice more, the Lord, the Lord. Interesting little bit of... Um, in the Hebrew here, which doesn't come out in the text, it doesn't come out in the NIV, but actually the, the precise um, translation of that is the Lord, the Lord God. It's Yahweh, Yahweh, Elohim. And it's the only place in the Bible where those two names are put together. That's significant. It's closely related um, in Hebrew to the, the name I am who I am. When, when, Moses, when God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush, he said, who shall I say sent me? And he says, I am who I am. It's a very similar phrase. Yahweh, it highlights the fact that God is self-existent. God is proclaiming to Moses his glory. He's showing him who he is. He says, I am self-existent. It means God simply is who he is. He's not dependent on anything else. He's not dependent on us. He doesn't need us. Instead, everything is dependent on him. He is the creator of all things. He is the sustainer of all things. He's always existed. He never changes. And then he uses the word El or Elohim. It talks of his strength. He's revealing how almighty he is. And goodness me, we have a mighty God. A God who is mighty to save. A God who is mighty to secure our salvation till all eternity. God is saying, this is who I am. Moses would need to rely on God's might. And so God tells him, I am mighty, I am able. And we need to know we can rely on him too. As we face our own trials through the wilderness of our life, we need to know that no matter what comes our way, he is mighty. He is mightier than anything that will come in our way. He's mighty to save us. He's mighty to sustain us. He's able to deliver us from or preserve us through whatever life throws at us. Isn't it significant that the first thing God reveals about him about himself is his name. Remember when Jesus taught his disciples to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
Finally, God reveals certain things about his glory, certain things about his character. Um, he, he reveals that he is compassionate. That is, he's not some sort of distant, uninterested God. He's a God who's personal. He's a God who's right there with us. He, he, he reveals that he's gracious. We don't deserve his care, but he shows us his care in any case. He reveals that he is slow to anger. Although God will eventually judge those who refuse to repent of their sin, he's in no hurry to do so. Instead, in his patience, in his slowness to anger, he offers repeated opportunities for sinners to repent. For sinners to turn away from their sin and turn to him. However, of course, we must never presume upon that patience. He goes on to say that he is abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands. Uh, the thousands there we know refers to thousands of generations, not thousands of individuals. So thousands upon thousands of people. This word abounding, it means um, overflowing. Overflowing bountiful supply, that's what it means. God's love is more than enough. God's mercy is more than enough. His graciousness is more than enough to satisfy the needs of countless thousands of generations. And his faithfulness guarantees that he will never withdraw it. <laughs> he says he forgives wickedness. He forgives rebellion and sin. You know, this word forgive means, it literally means to lift up a burden and take it away. That's what the word means. God lifts the burden of our sin off of us and he places it on Jesus who then dies to pay for it. And in doing so, he takes our sin away from us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Paul wrote this. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And then in 1 Peter 2, 24, Peter writes this. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. Christ takes our sin, he lifts our sin and he takes it away. God is, forgives wickedness, rebellion and sin. And then finally he says, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. You see the different sides of God's character. This is an, an attribute of God that people don't like so that this is one they sort of get away with they conveniently bypass sweep it under the carpet he does not leave the guilty unpunished you know if God could simply overlook sin then he would cease to be God he would cease to be holy that's why every sin will either be punished in hell or pardoned in Christ every sin either punished in hell or pardoned in Christ. It's through the cross of Christ that we see the glory of God manifested in the most public way. There is no greater demonstration of God's holiness, God's justice, God's, God's, justice, God's wrath. There is no greater demonstration than the cross of God's love, of God's mercy, of God's grace. No wonder Paul says, we preach Christ and him crucified. So Moses sees uh, just a glimpse of God's glory. Just a, just a bit of God's glory. And in Exodus 34 verse 8, we're told what happened. It says that Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshipped. He bowed to the ground and worshipped. The ESV says... Moses quickly bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped. I bet he did. I bet he did. I bet he fell flat on his face. That was the only response possible when coming close even to the glory of God. And friends, it should be our response too. When we are confronted with the glory of God, just a glimpse of it. Do you remember when Isaiah was given a glimpse of the glory of God? He cried out, woe to me, for I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. 
When John saw something of the glory of Christ on the Isle of Patmos, we are told that he fell at his feet as though dead. When we truly realise who God is, what God is like, it will cause us to fall at his feet too and worship him. You know, people who think they can casually stroll into church and have a bit of a sing-along, they don't understand who God is. They have a very small view of God. They're worshipping a God of their own imagination rather than the God of the Bible. Whereas when we are prepared to pray honestly, Lord, show me your glory. When we're prepared to walk in that door and stop and pause and pray and say, Lord, whatever you do, show me your glory. And then wait expectantly for him to do so. Then just like Moses, we will be quick to bow. We will be quick to worship him because we will come face to face, as it were, with something of his indescribable magnificence. magnificence. And it will cause us to worship You know, I began this message by quoting A.W. Tozer, who said, God is looking for men in whose hands his glory is safe. So I want to ask you today, is God's glory safe in your hands? How big is your God? Is he bigger and more gracious and more glorious than you could ever imagine? Or have you somehow reduced him down to something that you can manage? Have you put him in your box? Oh, we got a visitor. Come on in. <laughs> got an escape here. We need to bolt the doors. Don't we? You know, in the very last chapter of Exodus, Moses witnesses God's glory again, possibly for the last time. We read about it in Exodus um, 40, 34 through to 35. Sorry, 34 to 35. It says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not even enter the tent of meeting because the, the, the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses couldn't even go in. You know, one day we will all see that for ourselves. Do you realise that? One day there is a future that awaits all of us who have placed our faith in Christ where we will see God's glory. In the Revelation, um, John was given a vision of the future. And in chapter 21, he, uh, he writes this. It's the first three verses of Revelation 21. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. He says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them. And they will be his people. And God himself will be with them. And he'll be their God. And then in verse 9 to 11, he says this. He says, one of the seven angels carried me away in the spirit to a mountain. And he showed me the holy city. He says, it shone with the glory of God. It shone with the glory of God. And its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel. Brothers and sisters, that awaits us. That is the glorious future that awaits us. That mountaintop experience that Moses had, we are going to experience in a greater way. Because by then we will have glorified bodies. We will be able to stand in the presence of God. No wonder that in the very last book of the Bible, John described what happened to him when he saw that. He said... I fell down and worshipped him. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, we pray that you will show us your glory as we read your word and as we unpack it. But Lord, I want to pray that that doesn't just happen on a Sunday. Lord, show us your glory throughout the week. Father, show us your glory every time we open your word, every time we sit down to pray, every time we fellowship with other believers, every time we even walk in nature. Lord, show us your glory. Help us, Lord, not to ignore it. Help it not to slip by unnoticed. Help us, Lord, instead to be open, to accept it, to accept you for who you are, and simply to worship you. I want to close with a, a few words from God's word. These are words from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, where Paul writes, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. Amen. Well, thank you for coming along and uh, I do pray that as you leave this place the sense of the glory of God won't just fade away but you'll carry it with you as you go through the week. Now I'm not sure the best way to evacuate you all, I'm meant to do it in a routine aren't I? I'm going to be really simple, I'm going to say if you guys sort of head out that way and then you guys can head out that way, that's probably about going to do it. Goodness me. <laughs> Forgive me for that, folks. Let's, let's, we can't sing it, can we? But let's absorb the words of this wonderful hymn, Thine be the glory. Thine be the glory.
as prince of a lie. Life is not without thee, aid us in our strife. Make us more than conquerors through thy deathless love. Lead us in thy triumph to thy home above. Thine be the glory, risen, conquering Son. Endless is the victory Thou, O oh, death, hast won. Thine be the glory. Conquering Son, endless is the victory Thou, O oh, death, hast won. The time not to make a serious mistake when you're preaching is when it's being live streamed. So, <laughs> so perhaps for the benefit of those who watch later, Gareth will be able to do some clever editing and make that all seem seamless. As we were, thanks for coming. It's been really good to see everybody. And uh, make your ways out through that exit there, or through the side exit, or through the main entrance there. Thank you.